The Office of Early Childhood is the state agency responsible for the licensing of family child care homes in Connecticut. This presentation will help you learn about recent changes to the regulations that govern licensed family child care homes. The work to update these regulations began many years ago. The changes are responsive to the feedback we have received over many years from providers, parents, local and state officials, our own licensing staff, and others. We want to thank everyone who contributed to this effort by sharing their expertise, opinions, and suggestions to make these revisions finally take effect. Before I begin reviewing the changes to the regulations, I want to share the mission and vision of the Office of Early Childhood. The Office of Early Childhood recognizes that family providers share our vision of ensuring children are safe, healthy, learning, and thriving. Working together, we can achieve this shared goal. The licensing regulations are designed to protect the health and safety of children. Putting the requirements of these regulations into practice is a responsibility of family providers and the Office of Early Childhood. Working together to do this will bring about the best outcomes for the children. This presentation will discuss the reasons why the changes to the regulations were made. This presentation will not review every single revision to the regulations, but rather will review the most significant changes. The order of the presentation follows the order of regulation sections. Providers should obtain from the Office of Early Childhood website a full copy of the regulations and read them thoroughly. On the website, there is also a plain language summary of the key changes. So, why were the regulations changed? Some of the new language clarifies what is expected by a requirement to make it clearer to providers and licensing staff. So, a language change is not necessarily a new requirement, but rather spells out in more detail what the requirement has been and the expectations for compliance. This will help support consistency when the regulations are applied. Other requirements have been put in place so they are in line with national best practices, such as those specific requirements related to safe sleep. Some previous requirements had been identified as unnecessary or overly burdensome, and so were eliminated or modified. You will also identify new requirements that aren't just necessary to protect the health and safety of children. And finally, some requirements were put in place to comply with federal requirements. I will now begin to walk through sections of the regulations and highlight the key changes. The first section contains the definition of terms that are used throughout the regulations. The revised regulations contain two key changes to the definitions. First, the revised regulations expanded the definitions of child and school age, which now permits licensed providers to care for persons through age 18 and through age 20 for children with special needs. Previously, only children age 17 and younger could attend a licensed family child care home. The regulations now specifically indicate that night care is care that is provided for one or more hours between 10 o'clock p.m. and 5 o'clock a.m. This means that care provided outside of these hours does not require a provider to meet the additional requirements applied to those providing services during the night. The regulations previously required that a provider may not use a substitute staff on a regular reoccurring basis. However, this was left to the interpretation as to what is considered regular and reoccurring. The regulations are now very specific and indicate that a provider shall not use and approve substitutes in the absence of the provider for more than one hour per day on a regular reoccurring basis. This is an example of the regulations being modified to clarify a requirement. For a limited and specified period, for example, a vacation, 
use of an approved substitute staff would be allowed in excess of one hour per day, as this would not continue on a regular reoccurring basis. Earlier on, I had identified that some changes to the regulations were to loosen the requirements. Here is an example of this. The old requirement had restricted a provider from caring for no more than two children under the age of two. The regulations now restrict the number of young children to no more than two children under the age of 18 months. This allows a provider to accept an infant sooner than previously would have been allowed. Another example of a change that has been put in place to clarify a requirement is the requirement around notification of change. The list of circumstances that must be reported to the Office of Early Childhood within five days now specifically include the renovation, construction, or expansion of the facility, installation of a swimming pool, a change in customary business hours, and criminal convictions or a DCF investigation of the provider, staff, or household member. The regulations no longer require that currently licensed providers send their medical statement to the Office of Early Childhood, but rather they only need to maintain a medical statement on site. Additionally, the medical statement needs to only be updated every three years rather than every two years. A TB test is no longer required as part of the medical statement. The OEC will no longer approve first aid courses. First aid courses by the American Red Cross, American Heart Association, National Safety Council, American Safety and Health Institute, and Medic First Aid International, Inc. are all approved, as well as any course approved by the Office of Early Childhood as of March 17, 2018. Current CPR certification is now required of all providers. For both first aid and CPR, the certification shall be based on a hands-on demonstration. This hands-on demonstration may be remote or in-person or a combination of both. CPR certification must also be appropriate for the ages of the children served at the family child care home. Verification of such certifications shall be kept on file at the family child care home. As substitute staff must meet the same requirements as the provider, they too must also have CPR certification. The time in which a medical emergency caregiver must be able to arrive at the family child care home has been increased from 10 minutes to 15 minutes. The regulations also now clearly indicate that the emergency caregiver shall be able to immediately notify parents of all children present in the event of an emergency. This means that they must have access to the children's contact information. The regulations now give specific examples of household substances and materials that may be potentially harmful and therefore shall not be accessible to children. These examples include some of the items that were frequently cited, and so this will help providers identify what types of items should not be accessible to children. The handling of biocontaminants is specifically mentioned in the regulations indicating that items such as blood, bodily fluids, or excretions that may spread infectious diseases shall be disposed of in a safe manner. This is an example of a requirement that is necessary to meet federal requirements. The regulations previously required that electrical cords shall be in good repair. The regulations still require that electrical cords be in good repair, but the regulations now specify that the cords must also be secured and shall not hang within reach of children. When the changes to the regulations were being drafted, it was recognized that electrical outlets that were in areas not accessible to children did not need to be protected, 
and that outlets can be protected in ways other than using protective covers. Therefore, the regulations have been changed to only require that electrical receptacles in areas accessible to children need to be protected and also recognize that approved safety outlets, not just protective covers, are sufficient to meet the requirement. There continues to be the requirement that each room used for childcare shall have two readily accessible means of escape. However, now the regulations specify where the window must be located and what the exact measurements of the window shall be to constitute a second means of escape. Gates on stairs are now only required at the entry to stairways. For example, if children never go upstairs, it is only necessary that a gate be placed at the bottom of the stairs and not at the top. Furthermore, the regulations no longer require gates to be in place at stairway entries if only school-age children are in care. Gates shall always be available, however, in the family child care home. A written plan for emergencies has always been required, but now the regulations list the specific components that shall be included in the plan. The listing of these required components of the provider's written emergency plan will guide providers when they develop their plan. The provider and staff shall be kept informed of their duties under the plan and the quarterly evacuation drills shall be documented in a written log maintained at the family child care home. If the family child care home uses combustible fuel, a carbon monoxide detector on each occupied level of the home is now required. This is another example of a requirement that has been put in place to protect the safety of children. Previously, the regulation specified, excuse me, specifically required a five pound fire extinguisher. Now the regulations al also allow for an extinguisher that is more than five pounds, as long as the provider can manage its use. The regulations now specify that fire extinguishers must be installed according to the manufacturer's instructions, which may or may not include the use of hangers or brackets. The extinguisher may also be installed out of view, provided it is immediately accessible. The regulations continue to require that ammunition be stored in a separate location away from the guns and inaccessible to children, but now the regulations further specify that ammunition must be locked. The storage of guns and weapons in the home shall also be known to the provider. For purposes of locking up guns and weapons, the regulations define what types of locks are acceptable. For example, key or combination are acceptable. Likewise, the acceptable methods by which bodies of water must be protected are now clearly specified in the regulations. A fence or barrier, four feet high or higher, which totally bars access to the water by the children is required. However, the regulations no longer require the fence or barrier to be locked. However, if not locked, all entries and exits shall have self-closing, self-latching devices. If a wall of the facility serves as one side of the barrier and has a door, it must remain locked. Decorative ponds, fish ponds, fountains, and other bodies of water that do not have a fence or barrier shall be completely covered with a child-proofing grate or other barrier to prevent access to children. The room temperature, measured three feet from the floor, required to be maintained is now 65 degrees Fahrenheit versus 68. The regulations now specify that temperature of the water at the tap must be maintained between 60 and 120 degrees Fahrenheit. The regulations previously required that emergency numbers be posted in a visible location. 
For various reasons, including confidentiality, some providers expressed concerns with this requirement. Now, the regulations allow the emergency numbers to be posted out of view, provided they are still readily accessible in an area of the home used for child care and known to the provider and staff. A list of those specific supplies that must be stored in the first aid kit are now provided in the regulations. This includes specific supplies needed in the kit during field trips. The content of the written parent permission is now more clearly specified in the regulations. For example, the regulations previously stated that the written parent permission include any persons permitted to remove the child. Now the regulations require the name, address, and telephone numbers of the persons permitted to remove the child. The regulations also require the parent permission to specify any activity from the family child care home and any arrangements for transitioning children to and from school. For example, if a school-aged child was going to walk from the family child care home to the bus stop, the parent permission shall specify that the child is going to walk to the bus stop, exact location of where they will be picked up, and the supervision that will be provided when this occurs. The regulations also now specify, specifically list those things that shall be recorded in the incident log and what specific information regarding the incident shall be included. Once again, this specific information contained in the regulations will serve as a guide to providers and licensing staff when applying the requirement. The regulations now specify that the provider, staff, and children shall, at a minimum, wash their hands with soap and water before eating, handling food, and after toileting. I imagine this was already being done, but this is another example of being specific as to what the expectations are. The regulations now require that the provider put in writing their program schedule and require that such schedule is flexible and includes outdoor play. The regulations now specify that all manufactured guidelines shall be followed for furniture, equipment, and any toy that is accessible to children. The regulations require that children shall nap or rest on a bed, cot, mat, or other provision intended for napping or resting, which is age appropriate. Furthermore, Cribs must comply with the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission standards and documentation demonstrating compliance must be maintained on site at the program. The ways in which this can be verified is either a tracking label, a registration form, or a child product certificate or test report. Details are listed in the regulations. This is a requirement that has been applied for some time under the requirement that providers must provide safe sleep. But now the language of the regulations specifically lay out the expectations. Many children with disabilities or special health care needs require special care be taken or provided when the child is at the family child care home. Examples of this may be a child that has a nut allergy or a child with a hearing impairment. In these cases, the regulations require the provider maintain a written plan developed with the parents and healthcare provider to meet the child's needs. The plan shall include appropriate care of the child in the event of an emergency and be signed by the provider, staff, and the parents. Safe sleep practices for infants are now clearly specified and are consistent with national standards. These include placing infants to sleep on their backs, using only crib mattresses that are snug fitting and covered by tightly fitted sheets, placing no items in the crib, removing bibs and garments with ties or hooks when placing infants to sleep, not attaching toys or objects to cribs, 
and not allowing infants to remain asleep in car seats, swings, or other places not specifically designed for infant sleeping. These requirements are all specifically listed in the revised regulations. Swaddling is now prohibited unless there is documented instructions and time frame from a physician, physician assistant, or advanced practice registered nurse. It is now required that infants be physically observed while sleeping at least every 15 minutes. No child under three years of age shall have access to teething necklaces or bracelets or other jewelry that could present a choking or strangulation hazard. Finally, all of the sleep policies must be posted in the family child care home and discussed with the parents. The regulations now require the provider to share with parents of enrolled children the dates and times that staff will be used as part of the family child care home. The regulations now require that the provider be either indoors or outdoors with all of the daycare children unless an approved staff is present to supervise. It is also clearly stated in the regulations that monitoring devices do not replace supervision by the provider. Diagnosed fractures, diagnosed second or third degree burns, and diagnosed concussions have been added to the list of conditions that must be reported to the Office of Early Childhood and requires the reporting of such conditions and the death of a child no later than the next business day. I mentioned earlier that the exact hours for which additional night care requirements apply is now specified as between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. A separate bed appropriate for each child must be provided if care is provided between these hours. The regulations clarify that a cot is not considered to be a bed. The regulations previously prohibited any children of the opposite sex to sleep in the same room. The regulations now allow siblings of the same sex to share a room with parent permission. A child shall not share a room with any adult. In regard to the administration of medications, non-prescription topical medications shall now only be administered in accordance with written parental permission. This was something that was strongly recommended, but not required. It is now required. However, the maintenance of a medication administration record for non-prescription topical medications is no longer required. Any provider that will be administering medications shall be trained in the methods of administration of medications that cover the general components listed in the regulations. They must also complete training on the specific route of medication they will be administering. For example, if they will be administering an oral, topical, or inhalant medication, they must complete general training on the methods of administration of medications and also be trained on the administration of oral, topical, and inhalant medications. Likewise, if a provider is going to administer an injectable medication by a pre-measured commercially prepared auto-injector, that is the EpiPen, they must complete general training on the methods of administration of medications and also specific training on the administration of the EpiPen. In this second example, they would not need the training on oral, topical, and inhalant medications. The need to submit a request to the Office of Early Childhood for the administration of rectal medication and medications other than by a pre-measured commercially prepared auto-injector is no longer required provided the general training on the methods of medication administration and specific and training specific to the route of administration is completed. The regulations now permit emergency equipment and medications to be stored inaccessible to allow for quick access. And children may now self-administer medication provided there is written permission from the parent and authorized prescriber 
on file at the family child care home. So what's next? These revisions became effective on March 19, 2021, and so all providers must take immediate steps to comply with the new requirements. By listening to this video, you have taken an important step to familiarize yourself with the new licensing regulations. Providers should also obtain a full copy of the regulations from the website and read these line for line to understand all changes. A plain language summary of the changes has also been posted on the website. If you have a question that is not answered in this video, please reach out to the OEC Help Desk at 860-500-4450. Or, better yet, reach out directly to your licensing specialist. The Office of Early Childhood will monitor compliance using these new regulations when visiting programs. When a provider is found to be out of compliance with a requirement, several factors will be considered given the recent passage date of these changes. The Office of Early Childhood will consider the time that has elapsed since the new requirement became effective on March 19th, what the actual requirement is, and all efforts taken by the provider to comply with a, when evaluating compliance. For example, there is a new requirement for CPR certification. This is the most significant change that applies to all providers. Providers should immediately take steps to register for a course. However, a course may not be offered for several weeks. A provider should keep record of his or her efforts to find a course so that can be shared with the inspector during the inspection. We hope this video has helped you become familiar with the changes to the licensing regulations and thank you for your continued efforts to protect the health and safety of Connecticut's children.